Kirby is no stranger to reinvention. His ability to transform himself aside, the games he's in often experiment with new settings and gimmicks as well. Whether it's rolling a limbless Kirby with the DS stylus and canvas curse, piloting mechs in Planet Robobot, or fundamentally changing how he transforms at all in Epic Yarn. Kirby in the Forgotten Land might seem like another addition to that list at first glance, this time warping the traditionally 2D structure into 3D levels. But in reality, this platformer feels like the next big step for a more classic Kirby formula rather than an upheaval of it. And it's one that skillfully translates the things I love about Kirby into a fresh but still familiar new perspective. The Kirby series isn't one I would have guessed would get a post-apocalyptic setting, but after a wormhole opens up above Dreamland, that's exactly where we find our pink protagonist. Amidst the rusted buildings and pleasantly vibrant overgrowth, it's up to Kirby to rescue as many kidnapped Waddle Dees as he can find and help them to rebuild their newly settled town. With that simple but effective setup out of the way, you'll float your way through a series of linear levels sucking up enemies to steal their powers and finding secrets along the way. Obviously, the shift from 2D changes how exactly you go about doing that, but the movement, combat, and general way alternate paths or items are hidden are all recognizable and satisfying. It's also a joy to track down the Waddle Dees hiding in optional offshoots and secret alcoves, especially since new buildings will spring up in town as its population increases. The levels themselves blend platforming puzzles with combat throughout, and the dozen or so copy abilities you get have amusing roles to play in both. Combat is fairly simple, but the different flavor each ability brings keeps it interesting whether you're burning baddies with fire or shooting them with a literal gun. On the platforming side, options like the ice ability let you safely skate across hazardous terrain, while the sword can cut certain ropes to open up new paths or items. All of these abilities are used in consistently clever ways, with every level pushing you to swap between them as different situations arise. Forgotten Land isn't a very challenging game, even on its optimistically named Wild Mode difficulty, but it's far from a mindless one. Harder enemies do push you to move around and make the most of each ability's limited moveset, especially during the handful of creatively constructed boss fights. Secrets can be well tucked away too. While I only died once or twice in my roughly 10 hour playthrough, it was rare for me to 100% a level on my initial run through it, and I was frequently tempted back in to dig up everything I had missed. It can sometimes be a little unclear when something is a secret path or just a gap in the scenery with an invisible wall, but that wasn't much more than an occasional inconvenience. The stages are distinguished by the themed worlds they're part of. There's a water-focused beach area, a snowy landscape with buildings inspired more by British architecture, an illuminated carnival ground, and more. Forgotten Land can be an unexpectedly pretty game, with a great use of color throughout and some elaborate locations at times, be those complex circus rides or rundown mall interiors. But while each world is enjoyably varied, the post-apocalyptic setting as a whole isn't an overly thrilling one. Kirby inevitably ends up jumping across different flavors of rusty rooftop or crumbling building in every world, and this human wasteland just isn't as cool as any of the fantastical places he's visited in his own universe. That extends somewhat to the new mouthful abilities he can use too, which includes the now notorious car transformation. These are everyday objects Kirby can't quite swallow, instead altering his body while his mouth is wrapped around them to let you navigate a specific area ahead of you. Kirby mostly turning into a vending machine would be more odd than it is clever if it weren't for the fun ways these mouthful power-ups are used and revisited throughout the campaign. That car lets you drive fast through some exciting tracks designed for speed, while the vending machine slows your movement but lets you rapidly fire cans out of your mouth. And one hilarious circular object basically turns Kirby into a giant air blaster that can knock away enemies, spin special fan switches, and even power little boats through the water. I'm not sure how developer HAL Laboratory did it, but they managed to make traffic cones, staircases, and even large nondescript metal pipes into genuinely entertaining transformations. You're given extra opportunities to test your expertise with all of Kirby's powers in the special treasure road challenges between regular levels. 
These bonus rooms give you a specific ability in a race against time, rewarding you with a special star if you can make it to the end of an obstacle course fast enough, and a handful of coins if you can do so under a target time. The treasure roads ended up being some of my favorite parts of Forgotten Land, acting as quick bites of optional challenge that often made the smartest use of what each transformation could do. For example, the fact that the Cutter ability's blade boomerangs back to you might just add a little extra damage during fights in a regular level, but in a treasure road, mastering that behavior could be the difference between hitting the target time or not. The coin reward for doing so is a fairly insubstantial draw on its own, but that didn't stop me from frequently trying to refine my movement and push my time below it anyway. The stars and coins you get feed into another neat addition, too. You can spend them to unlock upgraded versions of your abilities after finding blueprints to unlock them. Like giving your cutter two blades instead of one. That helps keep your powers fresh all the way through, even if it rarely changes how you'll actually think about using them in a given situation. Thanks to my relatively thorough playstyle, I nearly always had enough stars and coins to unlock all of them as soon as I found their blueprints, which meant the process of going back to town to pay for an upgrade was largely symbolic. But hey, the point is that my fire ability lets me glide through the air like a dragon now. Forgotten Land also has co-op play, but the way that's been implemented is a little bit of a letdown. It's nice that a second player can hop in at pretty much any time, but doing so feels very much like a younger sibling mode. Player 2 can only play as Bandana Waddle Dee, who wields a spear and disappointingly can't use any abilities, which past Kirby games have often allowed your partner to do. The camera also remains largely focused on Kirby with no regard for the second player, frequently causing them to fall off screen and teleport back to you like the world's shortest yo-yo. It's still a very fun time to run through levels or boss fights in co-op, it's just a far cry from the best co-op a Kirby game has seen. Kirby in the Forgotten Land successfully warps the series' already fun mix of ability-based platforming, secret hunting, and combat into the third dimension. The post-apocalyptic setting may not be as thematically interesting as Planet Popstar, but it is still lovely and vibrant with cleverly designed levels that make consistently smart use of Kirby's abilities. And despite the change in perspective, Forgotten Land maintains most of what I love about classic Kirby games. If the future means more 3D adventures for a hungry pink hero, I'd be more than happy to swallow them up. For more recent Switch exclusives, check out our reviews of Triangle Strategy or Rune Factory 5. And for everything else, keep it right here on IGN.